Welcome to Educator Circle for educators who love their work and want to get better. Right now is Wisdom Wednesday, and I have an amazing educator with us today. He also has a similar mission. He has a podcast called Teacher Voice, and you can find it on teacher-voice.com, which is very similar purpose to Wisdom Wednesday. So Ryan Hazinski, who calls himself also, or his kids at school call him, Mr. H has joined us to help solve the problems of the world with testing and the rating system uh, with teachers. So, um, Ryan, let's recap our conversation and involve our audience in what you and I were talking about with the absurdities of how bad the testing system has gotten across the United States and how you and I and all of our wisdom and experience in education have the solution. Would you take it away for us? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Helton, for having me on the program. It's a pleasure to be here on uh, Wisdom Wednesdays. And uh, again, Ryan Hazinski, I am a 16-year classroom veteran teacher. I taught in language arts my first five years, Then I did uh, six years in social studies, did math for a couple years. Now I'm currently teaching IB, International Baccalaureate Program, and I teach a class called The Theory of Knowledge which is the capstone course for all the students. And as I like to tell parents, the focus is really thinking, writing, and talking. Um, so it's very dialogue driven, it's very conceptual, it's all about the kids exploring their understanding in a very uh, friendly environment where they can have connections with their peers, but discuss really important ideas about knowledge and knowledge claims. So when I started teaching, and this was part of the conversation that we had uh, a week ago, you know, there really wasn't as much emphasis on the test. So I started circa 2004, and here in Florida, we had the FCAT, which was a state test in 10th grade they had to pass, you know, in order to get their high school diploma, they had to get a certain reading and math score. This has now mushroomed into a testing system that really stresses kids out. They are constantly being assessed, and because everything is all about the data at this point, even the youngest one, this is, I think, the problem that I find with it the most, the, the real young children are constantly progress monitored, you mm -hmm. know, to make sure that they're going to get a certain score on the statewide assessment. So because as, as you know, and as all the listeners know, in many states across the U.S. now, you know, the, the, the teachers are judged by the data of the test scores of their students. And Florida is one of 15 students where we actually grade the schools even and give them a letter grade, which really only co correlates to socioeconomic status, unfortunately. But so there are myriad problems. So where do you want to start? Well, one of the things that I'd like to talk about is how the people who are doing the tests and have created the tests that from corporate America have somehow uh, permeated education and those of us who are education experts you know I got my doctorate in educational leadership and one of the things that I know extremely well one of the areas is human development so mm -hmm. we we have learned about the brain we have learned about the development of children at certain stages and I don't care what anybody says any eight-year-old anywhere in the world that you sit and tell for five days in a row they're gonna sit for two and a half hours much less uh you know it, it's absolutely crazy and then the types of questions mm -hmm. you know i have a doctorate degree and those poor eighth graders that are doing some of the uh citizenship in the science tests and the way that the questions are worded when I was a teacher and a principal and a school superintendent, I used to come up with all kinds of ways to get the kids used to this in a fun way. And I'm telling you what, it was tough. I, I just felt for the kids and the teachers during that entire time. Mm -hmm. So what I want, I guess the first issue is the people who are forming the test, what should we do if you and I, had a way of solving this how could we just tell them hey this is not good for an eight-year-old and here's how we will really find out what they know and can do and this should be the purpose of a test taking human development into consideration you know i think i think ultimately one of the the foundational things that needs to change is just giving autonomy back to teachers i mean as you noted we are the experts. We've been through this kind of training. We know about what is 
developmentally appropriate for a child at certain ages. You reference eighth graders. I just recently saw a screenshot of an iReady screen for a kindergartner, and it said something about if you were to improve your writing, it would get worse. Just take that sentence and think about that from a five-year-old. I mean, they barely know, if they know at all anything about comparatives at this point, such as worse or better, let alone vocabulary like improve. I mean, that is way above what, a, a, now granted, everybody knows you wanna expose kids to as many words as possible, but a kindergartner is not gonna know that. And they're sitting at a screen with no direction from a teacher, that's only gonna confuse and muddle the poor child. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should really be about constructive play, and if we give classrooms back to their teachers, I think this is where it all begins because it allows us as the experts to recognize the child, each individual child, and the ways that we could perhaps support his or her learning, maybe with a portfolio of lots of different kinds of assessments that show the student has understanding and comprehension rather than just spitting up something on a vocab test or not a vocab test, any kind of standardized test that's just looking to fill in a bubble answer. It's not training kids how to think and I'm lucky in the sense that my theory of knowledge class and the IB program gives the teachers the autonomy to do what they want. They, IB recognizes you're a professional. And so, you know, I'm just told I have to cover four ways of knowing in six areas of knowledge and there's eight of each and it's my discretion. So, I, you know, a lot of the classroom interactions become organic. They allow the students to kind of express themselves at a place where they feel comfortable. Again, getting back to that human development piece, not everybody is in the same place. And so, I mean, it would look different at each level, I think, but fundamentally, the first thing that would, I think, change the game is allowing teachers the autonomy to come up with innovative and creative lessons, to be responsive in the moment to when students need something different. Um, you know, when we sit kids down for, for long periods of time, it's so unnatural. Um, what human being is told, you will sit here for two and a half hours, five days straight to do just this one function, unless you worked on like an assembly line which that doesn't even happen anymore now because so many of these jobs are being taken over by robotics. So we need to create an education system that allows students to both discover, be curious, all these things that the testing system is just killing. It's eroding whatever innate curiosity and desire to learn that children innately have. So I think it's really a big problem, but the first step must be giving autonomy back to teachers in the classroom. Let them innovate, let them be creative. Well, one of the things that I, have you ever been at the uh, school leadership level, Ryan, outside of the classroom? Have you no. ever been? Well, the very first thing when you say that, because I've been there, <laughs> and I mean, it depends on where you are, right? I had mm -hmm. a teacher one time that had liquor uh, in his drawer, and the kids, <laughs> and you know, and, and they did not, this was my first, uh, let's see, my second assistant principal role, right? The first, the second job I had as assistant principal, uh, the teachers told me that they did not have to show me their lesson plans. I was asked to go to the school as, because I was known as a strong instructional leader and the school mm -hmm. was what was in a very damaging situation. Uh, they were getting ready to close the school. And back in the 90s, this was, uh, they called them uh, not turnaround schools. There was a different name for it at that mm -hmm. time, but it meant that the school was about to close if you didn't turn it around, right? So they sent me there for that purpose. And the teachers there, there were 36 teachers, and out of 36, there were three at this particular environment that I would be considered good. You know, and so in environments like that, I understand why the measurements got instituted, why mm -hmm. we need the measurements, because uh, there just needs to be a way to measure. They say, uh, I think it was Peter Drucker that said, if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. So I think the measurements are important, but I think the types of measurements are what I'm concerned with. I, I think the criterion reference assessments, and for those of us in our audience that might not know the difference, there's norm referenced, which yeah. are the way that you normalize, uh, the, the way that you check knowledge and skills, 
and the criterion reference are considered critical thinking exams. And if you all have not seen these, you have got to look up some of these exams. I believe the criterion reference are great for us in the classroom for us to diagnose the critical thinking yeah. abilities of the kids, but to use them as a measurement on how the teacher is performing or how the school is performing is where we've gone wrong. That's my argument. You know what I'm saying? Excuse me, my other line here. I'm going to try to turn that off, but yes. So, and I just noticed while I'm looking at you that you and I have the same glasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I'm glad you brought up the criterion reference piece yes. because that is a particularly vexing problem, especially here in Florida, um, because for us as the teachers, it's a moving target. We don't even know what that constitutes because everything is behind, you know, the, it's the secret sauce of the FLDOE. So mm -hmm. what we know is that students aren't proficient here in Florida, for instance, if we're just looking at literacy, only uh, roughly a third of students in Florida can, are considered proficient in reading which would be level four, or level five on that criterion reference test that we have here in our state. But again, one of the solutions that I, we had talked about to me in, in terms of a significant reduction in the amount of testing, although this admittedly has its own challenges, is I, if I had my druthers, I would just scrap all the state testing and just use a norm reference test especially for the high school graduation concordance piece. I mean, I don't understand, they already have as a backup, students can get a concordance score, whether it's the ACT or the SAT. Right. Not make that the standard, so that way teachers can have, maybe still have some kind of data that you can use. I mean, portfolios are used in other states. It's not as quantitative, but you could still have qualitative measures by showing the work you've done with students and everything else. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it would, again, free up a lot of the testing. It would free up a lot of the the stress of the students, the anxiety that they experience, it would save the state a lot of money. But I think this is the other flip side to this whole equation. What's on the other side is that, again, going back to what you said originally, these testing corporations, the conglomerates, the apprentice halls, the big companies that are out there, you know, this all started with the NCLB and that kind of the, prol the proliferation happened after NCLB. And so a lot of these testing companies grew along with the industry. And so we just changed our standards here in Florida for the fifth time in 24 years. That's just dollar signs, you know, for the, for the, the corporate uh, giants that are a big part of the education industry. And again, I don't have any problem with them making a buck. This is America. This is what people do in our, in our capitalist society. But at the same time, when it becomes the be all end all that's driving instruction and driving how teachers are assessed, it's terrible. It's especially terrible for the students. Yes. Well, one of the things that we ended up doing at Educator Circle to help the schools because of the so many different standards, all of that, uh, one of the things that we train people to do is how to create what we call power standards. What are those essential? Uh, deal breakers that you want the kids to be able to do at your grade level and then help them find what they are. For example, a first grader would be reading 70 words a minute on a first grade prompt and they would be comprehending at this level on a first grade prompt. Third graders would know their multiplication tables all the way up to 12, you know, that sort of thing, which are basic skills. And bottom line is we know by working with kids mm -hmm. and that the essential issue is that they need to learn how to learn and learn yes. how to be able to think and to develop their minds. And, and to your point about the higher education testing, isn't that what we're trying to do by the time they graduate to prepare them for college readiness or career readiness or career options? And so therefore, shouldn't, be, shouldn't what we do with our high school kids be aligned to that purpose? So you know, let's choose a lane, ACT, SAT, and then let's get our kids, everything that we're doing instructionally aligned with that and not all these different kinds of things. They're not succeeding with, with the criterion reference test because they're not mm -hmm. aligned to that. Uh, you know, we have to hurry up and let them pass the 10th grade test and then start working on the ACT and SAT. Uh, that doesn't make sense, you know, what we're doing there. And I think if we approach education much more holistically in the sense that you said, where we're really trying to impart 
what it is to be a learner's learner, a, a, you know, a, a self learner, you know, the system because of the testing, as I said earlier, sort of takes away that drive. I mean, many students, if you talk to them, I'll, I'll ask my students, and they're very intelligent IB kids who, who are very perceptive. They'll say how much they can't stand the testing, and they wonder how, why is it so pointless? IB, for instance, their final exams to get the IB diploma, the vast majority of it's written. It's like what you and I had to do in college. Mm -hmm. You know, you're given a book with just a bunch of blank lines, and here's a prompt, write. And you just have to take all these disparate ideas and put them together in a meaningful way and write a cogent essay. You know, that's what we should be training kids to do, to be constantly curious, to constantly be learning so that they can, their learning can be self-directed. Because moving into the 21st century, you know, with all this technological disruption that's coming and everything else, we need to have students who are lifelong learners that can be agile and think on their feet and be able to discern the challenges that are arising in their lives. And filling in a bubble sheet's never going to do that. Well, and the thing about it is, is the word you just used a perfect word, agile. I mean, the schools, what we're delivering to the kids in schools are in no way preparing them for society. It's, <laughs> we're basically, we've got babysitting institutions, but you and I know that it's very possible with just a few adjustments to make some changes in education that would impact the teacher's ability to perform at high levels and the school leader's ability to lead at high levels. And therefore we would be able to reframe and reform um, how we're serving our children, especially those who are underserved. Because obviously that right now in your career, that's not the demographic you're serving in your career, although you have in the past. In my background, all of my children and all of my schools that I've served have been the underserved populations. And so I had a very difficult task of number one, recruiting, attracting high quality teachers, and none of them were prepared for the circumstances that we dealt with. So we had to have very strong professional development and team building. We had to find a way to develop the cultures within the uh, schools so that the teachers were equipped and they wanted to work together well and they wanted to utilize one another's strengths. And the testing was one of the major issues and obstacles that got in the way of us really being able to do that effectively. So I believe that um, the, the solution is to do a norm reference test across the board and then to have internal criterion reference assessments so that the instructional leaders are able to use them in order to form school programming according to the needs of that particular population. That's the other thing, is we can't treat everybody the same. Mm -hmm. And it's right now, different. and that's the reason why we have different types of school systems. We have public schools, we have parochial schools, private schools, charter schools, and some people who homeschool, because everybody believes it should be done differently, and, mm -hmm. and they don't like the way each other's doing it. And, and we have different ways of innovating, but I love what you're doing. I love your teacher voice. I love the way you communicate about how messed up the world is in education. <laughs> and so I wanted you, because you are spot on in every category. So I want to encourage our listeners at Educator Circle to check out Ryan's podcast and, um, so in closing, Ryan, how would you, uh, let's say you and I are going before the decision makers at the highest level right now, and we've been charged to fix this issue. In a minute, let's tell them right now, should this get before them, how are we going to fix the testing conundrum? What do you think? Honestly... It would be an earnest plea, whether it's legislators or the testing company, people who are producing these things, just listen to educators. I mean, we are the people who are working with our children, uh, the experts in the room. And yes, to your comment earlier, there is going to be a range in quality of teachers. 
But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's a very human endeavor to be a teacher. You really have to approach it with the mindset that you are there to serve others first and foremost. Uh, and especially because these are children, this is the next generation. We have a moral obligation, I believe, that's incumbent upon us to just do our best. And ultimately, legislators, these corporate giants, are making it much more difficult by just not heeding anything that we say. So, I mean, I think I would make a very compelling case for saving taxpayer money here in Florida where we have a GOP-dominated legislature, but it would have to be balanced with satisfying the, the, the corporate companies, that, the, such as Pearson and all of the, the other imprints that are out there. HMH to to listen to us and uh, that's a tall ass that's a that's tall order a big ass whatever you want to call it I think it's difficult for because it's ultimately about control mm -hmm. and it seems as if in the 21st century teachers are not to be trusted we are to be controlled and that's where we get a lot of this legislation and a lot of this standardization for curricula it's unfortunate okay so legislators those of you who are listening we will help you with the measurements, but we do not respect your intent to control uh, parts of society because number one, you don't know what you're doing. Number two, <laughs> uh, that's why we went to school and we gave our entire lives uh, serving children and we've got experience. You know what that's called? Theoretical practitioner. That means we went to school and we did it. We worked with kids. We worked with parents, we worked with educators. So there are some of us who do know what we're doing. And mm -hmm. we need to be the ones that you seek um, guidance from and oh. use what we say. So, and to those of you who are educators, we love you, hang in there. We're working alongside of you. And um, if you need expertise, reach out to us because we're here for you. Okay, everybody, thank you, Ryan, for joining us today. This is Educator Circle with Dr. Lisa for educators who love their work and want to get better. Thanks again, Dr. Lisa.